yeah, sh you should be starting the live stream really soon. Okay, okay. Let's see, what can I do? Because I have a diff I have another one I have to check for him. Maybe, maybe you're on the small, so maybe on the small chapel. Try the other link, the I'm large chapel. Large ca I'm at large chapel. Uh, I don't know. Maybe someone could just ask either. Kirk to double check the stream that it's not right. I think he'll. Okay. Yeah, okay, we're gonna work on it for you. Okay, we gotta play large chapel, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Thanks. I wanna welcome friends and family as we honor today the life of a very beautiful, wonderful woman named Helen Cincinnatus. She was a Holocaust survivor, a beloved wife, an adored mother, an adored grandmother, great-grandmother, sibling, and friend to many people. She lived a long life with a lot of courage and dedication, a lot of strength, a lot of independence, and a lot of love. There's so much to tell in her life story. There's so much to tell about her as a person, and we'll do our best to share with you all that we can. And in our Jewish tradition, the purpose of what we're doing today is first to give her that honor, that we believe that she is here with us and present with us, and she hears what we're saying, and she feels very good in our recognition of all she was. How we look up to her, how we adore her, how we respect her, that gives her soul great strength. And we also inspire one another. We show each other what you can accomplish. A human being against all odds can do amazing things, and we should use her life and her inspiration to guide us, inspire us all. We also here to console the family and the friends, you know, through the stories and through reminding each other of the wonderful things she could accomplish. We hope to bring some consolation, some bit of strength in these hard times. We start with a selection from the Psalms. We read first Psalm 23. <speaking in Hebrew> Psalm of David, God is my shepherd, I shall not lack. In lush meadows he lays me down, beside tranquil waters he leads me. He restores my soul, he leads me on paths of justice for his namesake. As I walk in the valley overshadowed by death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in view of my torments. You anointed my head with oil, my cup overflows. May only goodness and kindness pursue me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for many long days. It is also our tradition to read what is known as the Eshet Chayil, the section from the Proverbs entitled The Woman of Valor. It talks about the great qualities that a special woman can have and follows the order of the alphabet. Kapa Veya decha shilcha li avyon, lo sira me besu mi shaleg, ki kol besa levush shanim. Marvadim asisala, vishish vargaman levusha, noda visharim bala, vishifta im zikni aretz. Sadi masisa vatimkor, vachagran asno knani, oz vahadar levusha, vatischoik le yoy macharon. Picha pascha behachma, vesaras chesed al yashaina. Sophia hali chos besa, belecha maslus lo sochel. Kamu vanecha ve Yeshura, Bala vi Halla, 
Rabos Panos Hasochayil, Biatalis Alkulana, Shekar Achain, Vehevel Ayofi, Isha Yras Adinoi, I Tishalel, Tenula Mipri Yadecha, Vihalucha, Vesharim, Maasecha. An accomplished woman who can find far beyond pearls is her value. Her, husband heart her husband's heart relies on her, and he shall lack no fortune. She repays his good, but never his harm, all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and linen, and her hands work willingly. She is like a merchant ship, from afar she brings sustenance. She arises while it's nighttime, and gives food to her household. She envisions a field and buys it. From the fruit of her handiwork, she plants a vineyard. With strength she girds her loins and invigorates her arms. Her hands she stretches out to the distaff, and her palms support the spindle. <clears throat> she fears not snow for her household, her entire household, is clothed, with, is clothed with scarlet wool. She makes a cloak to sell and delivers a belt to the peddler. Strength and majesty are her raiment. She joyfully awaits the last day. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and a lesson of kindness is on her tongue. She anticipates the ways of her household and partakes not in laziness. Her children arise and they praise her. Her husband, he lauds her. Many daughters have amassed achievement, but you have surpassed them all. False is grace, and vain is beauty, a God-fearing woman she should be praised. Give her the fruits of her hands, and let her be praised in the gates by her very own deeds. I wanted to share with you bits and pieces from the life of Helen. And most of these came from the stories and the beautiful recollections that were had by her children and her grandchildren. Thank goodness they got to know her very well in all of her years on this planet, almost 100 years. She shared and she connected and she knew the people in her family very well and they knew her. So these are their words, these are their stories that they would be telling you if you asked. So our dear Helen was born March 15, 1922 in a village called Klobutsk in Poland. Before the war, it was a small, beautiful town full of Jewish people living a good life it was Helen, her father, her mother, her four sisters, and the three brothers. And she was the second child from the youngest. But just six years into her life, she had a very sad loss. She lost her own dear father. But amazingly, somehow, her mother took over the responsibility of this large family. She took over raising all the children. She took over the parnassa, the livelihood, all by herself. And she didn't just do this in a way just to get by but she did in a way that showed her strength, her industriousness, and, and simply what a special person she was to be able to manage and guide this wonderful family. And mom's goals were not just to get Helen and her sisters through the life, but to make them look very special. They were always dressed so beautifully. They always had beautiful clothing, even though they were not very wealthy people. They always had a beautiful, clean, and luxurious Shabbos table with all the foods that the kids liked, a great effort. And this was the time that she grew up in, very good things and some hard things. But unfortunately, not too much into her life, when she was just a, an older teenager, World War II came around. And this town of Klobutsk, which before the war, for hundreds of years, was a thriving Jewish town, would be destroyed in less than a few days. At the very beginning of World War II, I believe around September 1939, this town was right on the border and was one of the first towns to be destroyed by the Nazis. They overran the town, they torched it, and they occupied every single building that belonged to a Jew. This beautiful Jewish society was destroyed in a matter of days, and no Jews came back to the town. The overwhelming majority of the inhabitants were murdered, starved, or worked to death by the Nazis during the Holocaust. But somehow Helen, with her incredible stamina and her intelligence and her courage, she survived this occupation and she survived the subsequent tortures, and she saw the worst sights along the way. <coughs> she arrived at the concentration camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau, in December of 1942. She got off the cattle cars and immediately was made to line up and face the infamous Selexia, the infamous selection, by none other than the horribly sick Dr. Mengele, who unfortunately has become very famous for his cruelty. He separated families at his own, at the movement of his finger, he would destroy people and families. 
Her mother and a sister with a three-year-old son were immediately sent to the crematorium. As, as would occur much throughout her life, she felt she had some special luck. Her luck at first here in the concentration camp was that Dr. Mengele pulled her out of the line, not to go towards the sign of line of death, but to select her to work and to be a person who would serve in some form of labor. I guess she appeared healthier and stronger than the others, or it could be this amazing luck that she would soon have multiple times that would get her through hard times. She was issued a number on her arm, which is a sign of the work that she had to complete. But even as a worker, it was no easy matter surviving in Auschwitz. There was almost never any food. And she once again was lucky because where she worked, some Czech sisters took her in in the infirmary and they brought her extra food, just enough so she could be a little bit more than just surviving. And even when she caught typhus, she had the terrible disease, the ladies in her block helped to save her life and keep her going on. Whenever she had the selection, she would pinch her cheeks and she would try to look as healthy as she could. And she was able to make it time and time again as the person next to her seemed to be selected rather than her. But I think the mazel she had, the luck she had, was her luck, but is really a luck for the whole family of the Cincinnatuses. Her luck that she was a survivor was the luck of the family that the family is around today to tell these stories. As the Soviet troops marched in to the Nazis' areas, they became desperate and they initiated the famous death marches. In December of 1944, everyone at Auschwitz was taken out of the camp on a death march. They were given no food, no water, and they were headed west in freezing temperatures in the middle of the difficult winter. If you couldn't walk, you would get shot on the spot. They were then taken to some trains that were open in Ravensbrück, Germany, until ultimately they were liberated by the Russians in April of 1945. As soon as she got out of those trains, Helen was determined with her mission, her singular mission to see what, would hap what had happened to her family, who had survived. And she would grasp the people who had survived, and she would continue with her goal to find out how to rebuild and continue this family that she came up with. She ended up in Bayreuth, Germany, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, where she married Morris, her future husband. And during those times, a lot of matches were being made in a very hurried fashion. Anybody of a similar age or similar town or circumstances were put together. There wasn't too much consideration for chemistry. There wasn't too much matchmaking. There was no time for such things. People wanted to just rebuild and get on with their lives. But the story between Helen and Morris was a very different, different one and quite an amazing one indeed. The story is that Morris, her husband, he was older by her than her by several years. And he was originally, before the war, married to her older sister, to Esther. And together they had a child. However, Esther and her three-year-old son, they were killed in the Holocaust. And it's the picture of Esther's son, this three-year-old boy, that hung in Helen's house all these years. And Morris spent much of his time after the war tracking down Esther's family. It was important to him not just to find out what happened to them, but he wanted to be a partner in rebuilding the family that his first wife came from. His goal was to find the rest of the family and rebuild. And through amazing circumstances, Morris found Helen, Esther's sister, and they in turn got married and they set out to rebuild the family that was lost. They married and they gave birth to their first daughter to Ruth in Germany in 1948. They were, set, they, they were determined to begin a new life, a life in a free country where they would have opportunities to do and to grow and to build the family. And the opportunity came about to go to Israel. And they proudly arrived in Israel in 1949, and that's where Jerry was born a few years later. But at that time, the thoughts of the family were, they wanted to make sure that the family, especially the children, could be raised in a country where they had opportunities, where there was things that they could really do to be more free and to be able to build the lives that they really dreamt of having. She really loved the, th the thought of an America for her children. The golden Medina, the golden country, was where her sights were directed. And things started to work out so that in 1955, Morris had a brother, Paul, who helped to put the family together. So first Morris went to America and he worked and he sent money back and he showed that he could bring his whole family and eventually the whole family emigrated to Cleveland 
after that. And Helen was just so proud that her children were in this country. She saw the Statue of Liberty, or Ruth saw the Statue of Liberty, and couldn't believe that their dream to come to America had come true. But many people at this point would, would lose their dream if they had to work in a sweatshop and work tiny, receive tiny amounts of money for huge amounts of work. But this is not the way that Helen looked at it. She was very proud that she could work very hard with her hands in these sweatshops to get started in this new country. And she proved her brilliance in, in these shops. She could make the most amazing high-end pieces. And soon she developed her abilities and her abilities became well known and she went from the sweatshop to the boutiques of the Ray Phillips Fashion House where she would build their most complicated dresses. And her skill as a perfectionist paid off in dividends in making these beautiful outfits. She had her own sewing machine at home and she loved to make outfits for her entire family. She constantly altered her own clothes because she truly loved doing it as her most enjoyable hobby. The funny thing was that she was very dedicated to the idea that you should not only look good in the clothes she made you, but they had to have as many frills and bows and adornments as possible. And there are stories that little Ruth didn't like all the bows all the time on her clothing. You know, enough was enough, you know, it was fancy enough. But her mother would chase her around the house with her needle and thread, going, you know, ready to attach the bow as soon as she gave up. And poor little Jerry, I'm sure, got his own share of uh, sailor suits and boy clothes, perhaps whatever was you know, appropriate for that era. <clears throat> so besides being the, the geshikta um, sewing person, she loved to cook and she loved to bake. <clears throat> and she was really, she was really confident about her baking. She, was con she felt that no one could do a better job than her. No one's chicken soup, no one's kreplach, no one's noodle kogel was half as good as hers. And so she made huge meals and no one ever left hungry. And sometimes she was a little forceful about her feeding. You know, her grandkids said that, you know, they liked her food, but sometimes quantities-wise they were ready for no more, but she didn't feel the same way. And she basically poured it in their mouth to make sure that they didn't leave hungry. And most of us, when we make a big meal, we think it's a big deal if we have one or two main courses, but she had to make sure she had at least five to make sure that no one left hungry. She was a truly independent woman, living in her apartment and able to live and do things for herself even after losing her husband. And even up until three months ago, she was determined to not give up driving. And she would say, I guess when you asked her about her car and giving up the keys, ah, talk to me when I'm 100, and then we'll see. But the fact she was 98 years old was no reason to give up her license quite yet. And I think I, think I, know, I know that people loved her as a person. Here was this funky 98-year-old lady who just always talked with people and always loved people. Wherever she would go, she would share who she was and find out who you were. She would come to the reunions and Jerry and Diane's family and was the life of the party and knew everybody and was friendly to everybody. And she had lots of time for her grandchildren, lots of time to, to spoil them and to take care of them and to really, really get to know them. And soon we'll have a real treat in the form of all the grandchildren sharing us with today, their lives and their memories with their grandma. And we also have even a grandson who's in London, who's with us on the telephone, you know, who'll be able to share as well. There's a lot more stories that I can share and a lot of amazing things about her. But the one thing I can share is that in the last few days of her life, she was probably like no other person that I've seen who was 98 years old and had a very serious illness. She was very positive, she was very happy. She would tell you nice things about her room in the Malt Hospice House. She, instead of saying, I'm in a different place, I don't know about this place, who knows what's gonna be? She would say to people, I just love the bed. The bed is so comfortable. And the people are so nice here. And, you know, it's those, that types of things. And, and, she <coughs> and she even said, see, she even had a sense of perfect timing you know, in, her, in her last few years. So the, the kids told the story that she recently had a procedure, a surgical procedure. And she had anesthesia, and we were worried how she would respond to this anesthesia. You know, how would it affect her? And I guess she woke up, not only did she wake up from the anesthesia, but she woke up with her eyes bright, and she told the whole family, whoever was there, I have a big secret to tell you. And I'm sure, boy, were they surprised. Not only did grandma or Bubby wake up, she had a lot to tell them after this anesthesia. And she proudly told them that she's actually not her correct age. You know, her correct age of 97, 98, she was actually a year older than that. She actually changed her birth date a long time ago, 
And now she decided of all times to reveal herself for the optimal dramatic moment that she could offer. So I guess a good way to end my part is that they, everyone would call, the, call her by the name Grandma Ima. And that was by her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren because that's who she was. She was a wonderful grandmother and she was a wonderful Ima. Ima, of course, being the Hebrew word for mother. And so that's who she was, a wonderful lady who everybody loved, a loving mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother. So enough from hearing from me these stories. I think that we would most love to hear from the people who were her blood, the people who were her family, and who were able to have such a blessing of having her in their lives. So I'm going to call upon all of the grandchildren to say, you know, some of them a few words. So we will have Steve in London come up, Steve in London on the telephone, Lisa and David, and then as well as Caitlin and Jeremy. Okay. So we're going to have all the grandchildren come up at the same time, and then those who want to speak will speak. Okay, Steve, just give us 10 more seconds and all the, everyone's going to come up on the podium and then, we can, then Steve will speak first. Okay, Steve, you're all set up. Thank you, Rabbi. Anna, Leah, Ella, and I are very sorry we could not be there with all of you to honor an incredible woman, my grandma Helen and our grandma Ima. Thirteen years ago, just before the birth of my firstborn child, Leah, I was here speaking in front of you to honor the passing of Grandpa Morris, Grandma Helen's devoted husband. Just last summer, Leah honored both Grandpa Morris and Grandma Ima at her bat mitzvah in Jerusalem. She reflected on the journey and sacrifice that they both made to survive the horrors of the Holocaust come to a newly reborn Israel in 1949 and then start over again to pursue the American dream with their two young children, my mother Ruth and my uncle Jerry. I don't think life for Grandma Helen was ever easy. While she may have been small in stature, she was larger than life. She was brave, tough, hardworking, directly honest, genuine, and persevered. She also had an eye for the beauty in the world around her, whether it be for altering a dress to perfection, meticulously setting a large dining room table on the holidays with fine china and enough courses to feed an army, or impeccably decorating her apartments filled with joyous family photos. I am fortunate to have had a close relationship with Grandma Helen my entire life, up until a few weeks ago, when I had the chance to hold her hand with both of us knowing it was the last time we would see each other. As a child, I fondly remember walking to shul with her and Grandpa Morris and enjoying latkes and sponge cake at her kitchen table. As an adult, it was deeply important to me that she, my wife Anna, and her great-grandchildren, Leah and Ella, have a real relationship, and they did. Until the very end, as frail as Grandma Helen had become, she would still ask and take genuine interest in how we were all doing. While Grandma Helen may be the last of her generation to depart this earth in peace, she will not be forgotten and her memory will live on in our youngest generation, Leah, Ella, Nina, Leo, Maya, Reed, Lila, and Isabel. Grandma Helen has imparted several life lessons that I will never forget. First, work hard, but also be sure to live for today and enjoy your life. You never know what will happen tomorrow. Second, always have enough food so to never be hungry, meaning save and plan for the rainy day. Third, keep it simple, be genuine, and tell it like it is, and expect the same from those around you. Finally, perhaps the most important thing in life is the love and happiness shared within one's family. I admit that in my own life, when facing adversity, I think about what Grandma Helen and Grandpa Morris went through to survive the Holocaust, start over again in Israel, and then once again in America. It makes
makes my struggle look like a cakewalk and provides proper perspective that I should not fear failure, but rather embrace opportunity. Before I finish, I want to pay my respects to my mother Ruth and my uncle Jerry. I know that Grandma Helen loved both of you and appreciated all that you both did for her until the very end. I also know it is her departing wish that all of us, all the generations, continue the tradition of our family to remain close and connected. Thank you. Okay, Steve, that was beautiful. <clears throat> I grew up with my grandma and grandpa close by. They were at every dance recital, birthday celebration, award ceremony. Grandma took two weeks to prepare large feasts for Jewish, Jewish holidays. We sat at the long table for hours enjoying. On many Saturday nights, I'd sleep over at her house. We'd watch Love Boat and then Fantasy Island. And in the morning, I'd get those extra thick pancakes. <laughs> she tailored every dress to fit me perfectly. All throughout college, I had the most beautiful dresses. At Adam's wedding, she tailored my dress as well. <clears throat> Everything was done with perfection and pride. That's her. My grandma loved life. Even a few months ago, she'd say she wants more time wants to live longer. She was still enjoying cooking, sewing, shopping for clothes for me, for my kids. She loved getting her hair done on Saturday morning. I asked her last August if she was still driving. She said, if I have a good night's sleep, I can drive. <laughs> you see, the women in my family are really tough. And I mean physically, too. We can keep moving and never really get tired. My grandma, my mom, and me, we're not that different. Grandma lived alone for 13 years after my grandpa passed. No depression, no loneliness, not her style. I live alone with four kids, no husband, no depression, no loneliness, pure joy for life, like my grandma. Grandma and I talked all the time about everything, all throughout my life. When I was struggling my marriage, she said, you've got to work with what you have. I tried harder. And that effort translates into the family I have now, with two peaceful homes, and we've never been happier. Grandma's strength is my strength. Her love of life is my love of life. Her chicken soup Maybe not exactly my chicken soup. <laughs> That's a hard one. <clears throat> I saw my grandma just on Tuesday this week. I surprised her. <clears throat> okay. The smile I got and those few hours of chatting, it's the most precious gift I've gotten in a long time. She told me, you have to enjoy your life. It's so simple, but it's everything, isn't it? I'm old enough to get it. She had fluid in her lungs that day, and it was hard for her to talk on Tuesday, so she chose her words carefully. I asked her, what's the happiest time in your life? She paused, and she said, when your mommy was born. Then she looked at my mom and said with a smile, almost a smirk, I knew that would get you. <laughs> I imagine I'll be the same on my, when I'm in her stage, cracking jokes. We are similar, my grandma and me. All throughout my life, growing up, I knew her story, how she survived the concentration camps, how she worked hard but enjoyed her life too. Her trips to Florida, that apartment that she loved, her apartment that she was living in till just a few weeks ago. She appreciated and enjoyed the details. 
When I kissed her goodbye on Tuesday, I let her know that she was the best grandma in the world. I said, thank you, and I love you. She said to me, I loved everyone as best I could. She did. She really did. My grandma, her story, it makes you want to go out there and pursue your dreams. What a gift to have a grandma. In my life for 45 years, pushing me to pursue my dreams, to survive any and all hardship. Grandma, your strength is my strength. I hope you can hear our speeches today because boy, are we celebrating you. First of all, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, I wasn't able to fly in to see Grandma before she passed, um, but I was able to do some FaceTime calls uh, with my wife and, and daughters from California. And in her last call, a few days ago, she was smiling, telling me my daughters are beautiful. And her last words to me were, I love you, David. <coughs> David, where is this David coming from? Uh, my endearing nickname for my mom's and grandma's Yiddish and Jewish roots. Some of my earliest memories are of Jewish holidays spent at my grandma's uh, house just uh, a short walk away from their temple. I remember attending services with my grandpa Morris. He'd sneak me, sneak me candies with a little wink and his contagious smile. And I remember coming home to the formal dining room dinner table fully set with fancy china and every single plate, fork, and napkin in perfect alignment. She would just be as proud of her beautiful set table as she was of the amazing food that came out of her kitchen. Course after course, after course, after course. Uh, her Kreplach soup really was legendary. And as I got a little older, Grandma had no problem putting me to work, helping her set that table. And I, rem I remember the sense of pride that she helped me feel and understand just from setting a table and making sure I did it right. No shortcuts, no sloppiness. Do it right or don't do it, she would say. That's just one example of Grandma's incredible work ethic, strong character, and wonderful sense of pride that made a huge impact on me as a kid growing up around here. Also, at that young age, I heard the stories about the Holocaust, all our family that was killed, and how against all odds, my grandma and grandpa managed to survive. Grandma always used the word lucky in comparing it today, when she described how she survived. David all, you have to be lucky. She never made excuses, just always demonstrated with action. She would say to me, you have to work hard if you want to get anything. Grandma was one of the last living Holocaust survivors, and although that was a defining chapter in her life, she managed to live a long and full life for another 70 plus years after the Holocaust, building a life and a family in the U.S. that now has over a dozen grandchildren and great-grandchildren and counting, mm -hmm. that will take pride in our family history and carry on the stories of Grandma and Grandpa for generations to come. While she definitely was a strong and independent woman, she also had a warm heart and a good sense of humor. I'm so happy she was able to spend some time with my young daughters last summer. She always loved babies, and it brought me such joy to see her laugh and smile with my kids before she passed. I know her big, genuine smile will be something that stays with me and my memories for a long time. <laughs> Thank you, Grandma, for being such a meaningful influence and role model in my life. I love you very much, and I'm going to miss you. I didn't, I didn't really prepare anything, but I figured we could share like a few really like happy memories that I'm gonna keep with me. So we look a little bit younger than me, <laughs> just a little bit, can't really tell. We came along a little bit later after um, these guys thinking that my dad was picky. Um, <laughs> but it, it didn't stop her, you know? So she <laughs> even when we were younger, she would still play along with us and we all know she loved me. Um, we were <laughs> going through her apartment the other day and all the pictures on her wall, there were like 50 of them because she loved keeping photos of her family. There were just pictures of me on the wall. Just <laughs> I got to rub it in my brother's face. Um, but she would play along with us. It, she'd play dolls with me. She'd play along with Jeremy. She'd do whatever we want. And even when we were younger and she moved to the apartment after Morris died, she would still sit outside while we were in the pool 
you know, having little fun, splashing around. It would be 90 degrees outside, and she'd still want to stay with us. Be like, wait, wait, let me go get you some fruit. <laughs> There's something to help us along. Um, going off to college was tough because I knew that it would be difficult for me to have to travel back if when this moment happened, and I'm glad this happened when it did so I could be here with you guys. Um, but I'll always have her clothing. I'm wearing all of her jewelry right now. Every time we came over, we had a full course meal. You already heard it. It would already, already be prepared for us. I would come over and visit for her, like, visit her after coming back from college. Be like, let me, let me make some latkes. Hold on. I'm like, Mary, you want help? No, 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 no. You'll mess it up. Like, <laughs> and then we'll have meal, fruit, whatever. She'll sh barely walking with her um, walker, and she'll still want to prepare it and not have me touch it. Um, every time we came over, she would have bags of clothing for us. Even the grandchildren know that she would have, let me, let me check in my closet one more time. I think you'll have another sweater for you in there and we'll just go through our clothes and we'll be all attached. That, that was great. And then when we got older, my grandma's like, oh, I had this, you know, earrings for you. Keep them, keep them. Like, here's this bag of jewelry for you. And she gave me a, an anklet that she used to wear when she was younger. And she said, I put it on my right ankle and she goes, no, no, it goes on left ankle. It's the party ankle. She's always very, <laughs> really particular about her everything. And we went over for dinner for holidays. We always had to finish our plate. It was a huge deal if we did not finish our plate. And even to the towards the end of her life, when we were in hospice and we were sitting in Menor Park, she would she would sit at me and go, "You really need to whiten your teeth." Like she was very, <laughs> very particular about everything we did and how we looked, and we always had to be the best. And she was great. She was a great grandma. I think. Good. Okay. Oh, I'll go. She really loved her grandchildren, so we just show them off all up here at the same time and put them on display. So I hope that worked, that worked out very well. Just some quick details. Following today's service, we're going to go in procession for the burial, the interment. And that will take place at the Zion Memorial Cemetery, which is on uh, Northfield Road by Rockside. And then following the burial, you know, sometime perhaps around uh, 530 or so, um, the family will be returning, will be coming to the Sherry Park Apartments party room, social room, and that's at 2111 Acacia Park Drive in Lindhurst, and that's going to be until 8.30 p.m. today. And then, then on Monday through Wednesday, there will be a shiva at the residence, which is the same building, 2111 Acacia Park. This time it will be in the personal apartments, which will be suite 512, and that will be from 1 to 4 p.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. So in lieu of flowers, contributions are suggested to the Call Israel Foundation um, on Green Road. So this time I'm going to ask everyone to please rise. We are going to re recite the, the special memorial prayer. And then following the memorial prayer, we will stay standing as the pallbearers will come forward. And we will be doing the mitzvah of honoring Helen as her, you know, her, as her remains are, are placed in procession going outside of this door over here to my right. El male rachamim, shaychein bam romim, ham se menucha nechaina, al kanfei hashchina, be malos kedoshim o tahirim, kezerakia mazhirim, es nishmas, chaya bas ephraim, shahalacha lo lama, bavor shanachno mispalim behas kras nishmaso, began eden tehe menucha sa, lechein bal harachamim, Yasti recha besisa kanafav li oilamim, but yit sor but sorachayim is nishma so. Adinai hu nachlasa, besanoach al mishkava beshalom, benomar amen. O God, full of mercy, who dwells on high, grant proper rest on the wings of the divine presence, in the lofty levels of the holy and the pure ones, who shine like the glow of the firmament, for the soul of our most beloved Helen Cincinnatus, Chaya, the daughter of Ephraim who has gone unto her world, and for whom we pray. 
May her resting place be in the Garden of Eden, and may the Master of Mercy shelter her in the shelter of his wings for all eternity. May he bind her soul in the bonds of eternal life. God is her heritage, and may she repose in peace on her resting place, and we say together, Amen. We give everyone just a moment or two to grab their things, and we're asking in the meantime that the pallbearers, the six pallbearers, could come forward. And then once the pallbearers are here, the family is going to follow behind the casket and walk out with Helen towards those doors, and then the rest of the folks in the audience will file in afterwards.